Hey everybody, I thought I'd make a quick video on my phone real quick to uh, start this show just because uh, touring kicked off for me a couple days ago, Tuesday of this week, and shows are selling out everywhere. I'm about to head out, go to Charleston uh, right now, which is sold out, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, um, Friday, uh, the, the March 3rd is if it's not sold out already it's going to um and then we have uh saturday raleigh afternoon show at good nights that's on track to sell out as well but i think that there's still um if, if you're listening to this in, in time there's probably still tickets left uh next week Asheville the Tuesday show sold out so fast that we added a Monday show which is also uh we put it on online um one day ago and it's already over half sold um so that will sell out as well um there is a uh let's see after that where am I um Atlanta Last I checked, Atlanta's not selling as strong as some of the other shows. Same with the following day, Huntsville, um, Alabama is a little slow. These things are like really unpredictable. The following day, um, I'm in Bentonville. Um, so that Friday, the 10th, I'm in Bentonville, Arkansas, and that show's like just popping off. <laughs> we put tickets online and two shows sold out immediately, added a 5 p.m. show. Uh, which is also sold out by the time that you're listening to this. Um, and just adding a bunch of last minute shows with like 10 day notice. After that, uh, Tulsa Saturday afternoon show um, just lined up. Uh, uh, I'll need to add the ticket link. Um, but Wichita Looney Bin on that Sunday, the 12th, um, two shows. Um, and uh, afternoon show and an evening show on that Sunday. Um, uh, I imagine once those tickets go online, they're gonna sell pretty fast. I'm working on maybe Oklahoma City, maybe Albuquerque, maybe, probably not Albuquerque, maybe Santa Fe. Um, definitely, it looks like Malibu's happening on the 22nd. Gonna work on some Southern California stuff. And then uh, first half of April, going to um, work on some stuff in New England. I am crazy busy right now. So go to shanemoss.com and also join my email list because we're adding shows um, like crazy uh, right now. And so you don't want to miss out. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff happening. Um, a lot of updates soon. Um, thank you to the One Health Initiative at the University of Tennessee for uh, for this wonderful guest. Check out all the work that they do in uh, the link included in the show description. And uh, I hope to see you guys out on the road. I especially hope to see in Vegas, there's actually listeners, uh, a lot of listeners of the show are coming um, to the May 14th show in in vegas and i'm gonna take that whole weekend we're gonna i'm gonna take like a bunch of people around on the strip and and stuff like that so uh if you're if you're on my shane moss patreon or the mind under matter patreon and and uh you go on discord or you write me a message anywhere on instagram or whatever else um i can i can try to give you more details as those come in um, so yeah, you guys are great. Those of you that don't skip the intro, you are my favorites. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I am back at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, this week, 
talking with Shalonda Reeves is joining me today. Thank you so much, Shalonda. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. So you do some very interesting work. It's a little bit uh, a little bit different than than uh, some of the topics we typically talk about and I know that uh, that people are going to be very interested in what you do uh, including uh, kind of combining um, education with uh, with VR and these new technologies and I'm really excited to hear a little bit of background about me I never went to college but I've been a science fan um, for a very long time um, and I took a lot of I, I have I have taken and continue to take a lot of online courses, and that's how I've uh, preferred to educate myself. So I'm okay. really excited to hear about how uh, about the future. So can you uh, can you kind of tell everyone what you do and some of your background? Yeah, I'm Shalonda Reeves. I am a assistant professor at the University of Tennessee in STEM education. So in essence, I study how people learn. And more specifically, I study how people learn in VR or AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, which most people call XR. So extended reality. So it's a mixer of all of it um, online, uh, many modalities. But those are the two ones that I try to design and study how they learn. How did you get into that? So I used to be a high school English teacher, actually. And I worked at a district that at the time had the largest one-to-one -one laptop initiative. And we had all of this really cool technology, but nobody really knew how to use it. And so it kind of piqued my interest. We had one lady who was in charge of our entire high school of like helping all the teachers. They, they were called like, um, I believe ITRTs, like instructional resource technology teachers, something like that. Um, and she was kind of running around with her, like a chicken with her head caught off. She actually used to have a bun on the top of her head. And at the end of the day, it would be on the side of her head because she was just running rampant everywhere. And so I asked her, like, how did, like, how did you get to do this? And so she told me she um, went and got certified in educational technology. So, so did I. I went to University of Michigan. I can't say go blue because this is UT. Um, and I went there and um, really became fascinated with kind of the design of it all. I saw a lot of parallels between design for online experiences and what I did in the classroom. And so then at the University of Florida, where I got my PhD, um, there was a a really big initiative to put all STEM courses. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, which your audience knows because I know they watch you well. And um, they wanted to be able to put them all online for online learning. Well, that required a lot of laboratories to go online, which wasn't a real thing for people at that time. When was this? Oh, this was like 2016, 2015. I think it started before I got there in maybe 2015, I got there in 2016. Um, and so I really got interested in developing and designing these online laboratories and recognized that it wasn't a whole lot out there from an educational perspective. It was all tech driven, like here's the technology, I created a thing, it's so cool, but like, is it helping people learn? And so now I'm here. <laughs> so. First off, why don't why don't you kind of set up more broadly what is educational technology? So educational technology is um, looking at how people use varying tools. So it's about really the tools. The technology is a tool. So um, as we progress in our technology, the tool changes. So, for instance, when education technology in the 70s, people were doing it using video cassettes and they could watch a course online and take a class that way. And so that was considered technology. Pencils are actually technology. Paper, anything that is a tool for helping people learn is considered te educational technology. So it's just how do people use varying tools to support? And so the tools I study are virtual and um, 
augmented realities. Hmm. So how, uh, uh, so when you talk about virtual labs, mm -hmm. paint me a picture. All right. Can uh, yeah, I, I want to without the VR goggles on be able to picture uh, what a VR lab is like. Okay, so typically um, a virtual laboratory would probably emulate a traditional laboratory. So what you see in your classrooms or in a research lab. So the beakers, the bench, the um, the goggles. The so you would emulate a researcher. So you would have a first person experience doing the experiment as if you are the expert. And so inside the laboratory, the virtual lab, there would be guides, um, possibly little icons that pop up to kind of walk you through what you should do. There may be a virtual facilitator in there that's, you know, um, flying around telling you what you need to do. It just really depends on the technology of what's available to you. But it really um, is supposed to provide you a firsthand experience in conducting experience similar to a actual scientist. What were the first uses of that? What was it originally kind of designed for a virtual lab? So virtual labs um, were really designed as simulations. So it was very rudimentary um, physics simulations. So FET is one big one, if people want to go look that up, um, where you could go online and you want to see how much force would it take to, you know, I don't know, move a object. And so you would put in numbers to add force. So the simulation would be set to zero. You add numbers to it and you would see the more force you add, let's say how fast a ball moves, the more force you add. And so you would be able to actually see the ball move. So it didn't really have um, a more um, presence or you, you wouldn't have a first person experience. Presence is not the right word. People would definitely write you about that. It would have a first person experience of you actually being a scientist in the moment. So the virtual lab created more of a, um, real life experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But okay. who, who was it kind of originally designed for? It was for, for students. So it's for, always oh. been designed for students, okay, virtual right labs. So I, I for, didn't know if it was if it was like you you simulate something in a lab so that when you go into an actual lab, you don't bump into a beaker and make so everything explode. It's, it's kind of um, grown into that. So simulation and has always been around. So pilots use it. They use it in how they train pilots to fly. They use um, a lot of simulation in nursing, but their simulation is different because the the task trainer or the mannequin that they use is a tactile thing. It's actually there um, versus more virtual where you are experiencing something in a way that you would not be able to experience it otherwise. And so um, the simulations, in my opinion, have always been something that was geared towards creating another way to communicate information to students. And I, what kinds of students was this targeting? I, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of uh, like, like what, they didn't have access to, like, is, was this like, specific labs that maybe were I guess what I'm wondering is why why wouldn't they just use regular labs at campuses like oh, if if someone question. has yeah the, any place that has the resources for like cutting edge VR yep <laughs> but doesn't have a lab I, I'm trying to piece that together yeah so some things are you just can't see you know it's abstract and the concept is abstract. So if I'm talking about crystal structures, well, I can't really show you an atom. But if I want you to see how on a certain plane, the atoms touch a certain way or the how dense the atoms are or whatever the case may be. Well, that's something I can't necessarily show you. Right. I can show you a 2D graphic of it, like a picture, which is what you see in the textbooks, 
But how do I get you to see the planes when it's not a face plane? And so that's the one that's kind of right here. What if the plane is kind of at a slant? And now the atoms are touching different and I will have to turn it. So now there's more of a three dimensional aspect to what you're looking at or what you would traditionally see. And you have to create a mental model, this thought in your head of like, hmm, what could that look like? And it's like, <laughs> well, now you don't have to. I have a simulation or a way to show you that in a virtual environment that's a, that can support you understanding that. And so... And then you also have where some of the um, some of the experiments are too expensive. So yes, I am a well resourced lab, and so if you are a um, in a zoology course and you have to do you have to um, what do they do? They they do a experiment where they take an egg and you have to kind of create a small little hole in the egg so you can actually look in and see the embryo of the chicken. Well, what if I crack it? And that takes a little bit of experience to do. And so now I'm just cracking eggs. And so they actually have to pre-order those eggs to make sure that all of the chicken within the egg chickens, sorry, within the eggs are actually at a particular growth rate where they could be seen at a, you know, right. and so, but if we just cracking because this is my first time, <laughs> I see. that could be a little yeah. difficult. So you're, or maybe you're a veterinarian trying to like mm -hmm. virtually figure out how to do heart surgery on a dog or something yeah. like that. And or even if you're an undergrad, you know, and you're trying to um, undergraduate nursing and you're wanting to learn how to do an NG tube placement. And so NG tube is through the nostril. Well, virtually, you know, you would have to have a task trainer to do that. And now you are placing it, but we can't see inside the task trainer. So how do I know? And so we have to have varying sensors or varying, you know, elements within the VR experience that can support them and kind of see exactly where that tube is going and when it's too far or not enough. And how many times would you want to be able to practice that before you did it in a real person? And so now we're creating access and opportunities to practice over and over again, where before they could only do it, like you said, in that very high tech place that now requires a faculty member to be there and all of that. So... We're just creating opportunities to learn. Yeah, that's it. so. This it's a, a low risk simulation for. If it's it sounds especially useful in the context of creating a low risk situation to uh, a simulation of uh, a high stakes or yes. very expensive. Um, that would be an ideal yes situation, and then. Sometimes you do have places where I can afford or someone can donate a headset, but they cannot donate an entire lab for mm -hmm. me to create and maintain. And so when you talk about accessibility, it's much easier. And I use that in quotes because, you know, mm -hmm. easy um, to, to donate. 50 headsets to a school or a lab that may not be equipped to to the extent that maybe an R1 school like UT will be, but those students can still have that same kind of training mm. or at least experience, know that the thing even exists. And you you had also mentioned that a lot of a lot of these tools have also been kind of uh, co-opted or used by industry yeah. in various ways. I, I went through, um, uh, is it Ames in Iowa? They have a very, very large VR yes. facility. Are you familiar yeah, with it? I am. And um, Elliot, um, Elliot uh, uh, Wiener there I th is. I'm bad with names. So even too. if you said it, I wouldn't. Um, he, Let's just say he, it's he, sho he showed me around um, and he, he had uh, uh, like, th there was a whole bunch of, from creating virtual tractors mm -hmm. so that farmers could come in and use a tractor virtually before yep. a, a company decides to build these multi-million dollar yeah. uh, tractors yeah. <laughs> um, or uh, uh, there there was some kind of a uh, what 
What was the name? It's uh, uh, uh like on demand training. Is okay. that the is yeah. that the name? On demand the training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On demand training for for learning like in a factory setting yep. or whatever. And and one of the things that blew me away was he had me come into a three six a three hundred and sixty degree space that had projectors oh, on yeah. all the walls Those and are they cool. put MRIs in there. So. Uh, neurosurgeons mm -hmm. that were trying to, uh, before doing surgery on a brain hemorrhage, would look in this three-dimensional space rather than trying to yeah. look on this two-dimensional, like, well, that's a slightly more gray in that area, so I, yeah. I reckon probably about this depth to go right. poking around in someone's <laughs> brain right. and, uh, and, and giving them a much more accurate um, picture of of where uh where to operate yeah before so uh th those are i guess those are examples of of like both being used in industry and for educational purposes with i imagine training doctors yeah. and everything as well is that, is that kind of in line with the sort oh, of yeah absolutely that's um so I don't know what came first though the the industry or the education but it's I always say teaching and learning happens everywhere. It doesn't just happen in classrooms. Um, so industry training people is teaching and learning technically. It's just happening in a space that's not a traditional K-12 classroom. Right, right. And and so you started on this, you said 2016? Yep, 2016. And the field was pretty new at this time. Yes. Maybe 2015, maybe things had started. And, uh, and, and the... That, that feels like right around the time they're starting to kind of make some of the more uh, some of the virtual video games and things were becoming right. more and more popular. Yeah. Um, and it, how has in just the last at the time we're recording this, it's still I'm not sure when it's going to come out, but it's at the end of uh, 2022. How, how have things come along um, in the last six, seven years since you've been working in the field? Well, Initially, especially when you talk about um, doing VR in the more, in the less innovative, that may not be a good word, that, that may get you some feedback from folks, spaces like chemistry or physics. Um, so somewhere like medicine, they're, they're innovating all the time. You know, they're getting new technologies in and out. But when you talk about your traditional like chemistry classroom, not so innovative. Not a lot of new elements going up on <laughs> right. <laughs> on the periodic table. Right. Um, when you talk about, you know, your physics class, physics may be a little bit more innovative. But um, when I was trying to get into classrooms and more, when I say classrooms, I'm really meaning in undergraduate classrooms and laboratories, because that's where I typically do my work within um, and then workforce development. But you got a lot of, hmm, that's the VR lady. We're not really interested. But then the pandemic hit and I became so popular. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. pandemic was not okay in many, many ways. But for my research, yeah. it was like, Okay. Yeah. And so, if if you had if you had stock in Zoom oh, and man. Uh, in December 2019, <laughs> uh, if you bought a bunch of stock in yeah. Zoom, you uh, you're a wealthy person now, and oh. and uh, your your career benefited from. I should have. Uh, I definitely should have. Uh, but but you were you were able to um, uh, uh, benefit, I'm sure, in terms of. Uh, in, in terms of the skill set knowledge that you already had becoming exceptionally valuable and sought after yes. at this time. Yes. And so and then um, not only that, but yes, like you said, people started using Zoom more. Right. And companies were beginning to um, adapt their products to meet the needs of classrooms, because putting stuff in classrooms, now you're talking privacy and so now they're they're creating MOUs with universities that I don't have to do anymore. And it's like, yes, everybody get one, <laughs> have one. A M -O -M -O -U? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, memorandum of understanding. So it, in essence, it's an agreement between the university and whatever companies that they're working with, that they will follow certain rules and procedures and protocols. And especially when you talk about student privacy and data, because they're working within these virtual environments for maybe a grade 
or for a test. You know what I'm saying? And so there are different avenues you kind of have to go through. And so all of those barriers before for me were being knocked down automatically because um, universities were trying to retrofit their their STEM classrooms more specifically to be able to function online. And so they were looking for places. And so then they were like, hey, does anybody know? And I'm like, I know. Um, so because of that, you have seen great growth over time around putting virtual environments more specifically into classrooms. And then access, um, not only accessibility, but people's acceptance of it. You know, that's a big barrier, too. So it's not just what's available, but how willing are people to use those technologies? Um, and that has really changed over the years, which has been great for me. I, I'm curious what and um, students, I want to say that great for <laughs> students too. and students as well, but mostly <laughs> me. Yeah. Um, I, uh, it's a classic ego yeah. syndrome. You gotta <laughs> look like, out for number one. And students. Um, so are, are there, are there things that you've noticed? So the, the, uh, the virtual space, it's so exciting and there, but there's all of these things things happening all at the same time where where these where these capabilities take off and sometimes outpace demand and then other times demand outpaces capabilities and uh, in, in the virtual space it, it's it, it seems like that's uh, oftentimes just kind of always in flux and, yeah. and never meeting quite are, are there things are there examples where uh, I'll give you an example. Okay. So, so uh, VR thing starts, you know, taking off uh, in uh, in I I don't know 2017 18. It's becoming more more and more popular for people to have whatever right. the the vibes yeah, or whatever. Yeah, because you know back then the Ellen was like giving whole VR rooms away to schools and so that really you know made it attractive to the to individuals or districts and stuff oh, so interesting. that you can kind of see that that was becoming that she was making fetch happen right. in a sense <laughs> but but even just um people owning video game systems yeah, and, and plugging them into their computers and, and stuff and, and checking out you know virtual arts now taking off mm -hmm. and virtual paint and all of these things and um, there was this period of time when in stand up comedy, it was like, what if, what if virtual stand up comedy explodes, <laughs> you know, and no one wants to be the one that misses out on this <laughs> new wave. And I was like, I'm not interested. Yeah. That doesn't sound appealing. I don't think it's going to work. Um, and uh, I'm always so happy when I'm right about uh, things like that yeah. because I can be like a little bit of a uh, curmudgeon. When I, uh, <laughs> with, so with you some weren't of the, okay with the the virtual I, I was, I uh, comedy shows that they were doing on, over during the emojis. <laughs> during uh, the pandemic. And the during well during the pandemic, <laughs> uh, even I, I think I did one or two virtual shows as favorite to friends <laughs> I had no see the audience is your instrument yeah, and it's it, I all, heard that all all of the all of the things that make for it, so so go back to 2019 if you ask a comedian what makes for the best possible stand-up comedy space you'd be like well you want a really nice uh you want low ceilings and mm -hmm. a dark room and tightly packed almost uncomfortably close to one another <laughs> and really right up to the stage right. it was basically every single thing that's bad for quarantining <laughs> and, and, and disease spread and um and so, uh, and, and not to mention we travel or we're definitely like we are, uh, comedians are particularly biological vectors, but, uh, I digress. <laughs> the, 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 the point is, is, is it's doing things virtually without getting that audio yeah. feedback, everything else it's, and, and, and so. I even talked with some comics early on. This is before COVID. Okay. I, I, about um, well, what was what was it like? And 
comics are just so desperate for any attention that they're like, it was fun. And people would make their little emoji smile and Thumbs I could up. hear them laugh or whatever. Yeah, like that's, it's not going to go. It's not, it might eventually right. when we can have holograms and stuff yeah. like that, but it's not. And I, and I hear VR starting to like now, now a camera will be say on my face mm -hmm. so you can see my reaction in real yeah. time now that's getting a little closer to me being able to read yeah. a room and play with it you know and and so i'm not saying it won't be a good idea at the time it wasn't so that that that's one example of just things getting a little ahead of itself yes it, 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 the, there was this new exciting technology yes you could uh, host a virtual event mm -hmm. and stand and give a presentation in front of a virtual audience but no, it, w it was not quite ready for, say, stand-up comedy in particular yeah. and, and, and in ways that maybe people outside of the field wouldn't have been able to predict mm -hmm. um, when it you know, went live. Have there been, there, mu there must be a hundred examples like that that you have where, where things like, okay, we have the capability <laughs> now to virtually do this thing. And then it's just like not quite, there it doesn't yeah. hit right so it's always this um you know chicken or egg type of thing it's it's you know everyone is so oh the technology this technology is so cool you know you can do this and then everyone's like oh why am i doing this again because like, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you can like you can, okay yeah. and then it's like but i don't want to do this and it's like <laughs> yeah. then stop and everybody's like Oh, we don't need this, do we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so there's a lot of that. There's a lot of um, the technology is driving. It's almost like we're doing things just to do it. Mm. Not necessarily. Uh, OK, so I'm going to say couple, you gotta, yeah, Give me a couple fails because we'll throw some wins out there, too. But OK, give me a I'm going to say it. So right now, this whole the metaverse right and so it's supposed to be this place where people can just meet up and hang out yeah and and so i've been to a few of the kind of gatherings that they're having in different places and they'll emulate um you know a particular campus or a particular park and then everyone's sitting there and you're talking to other people and you're just like hey and they're like hey you have no idea who this person is it's mm -hmm. an avatar and you have these conversations and i gotta admit the entire time i was like you could be lying to me like the entire like I have no idea if this is a genuine it didn't feel genuine yeah like are we having a genuine conversation or are you just saying anything because I can't recognize you from a hole in a wall because you're a dog right now yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah, 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 yeah. you pick and so well, it just what's your avatar what do you I'm always I always make my avatar myself really yeah I try to make it you look, know like uh maybe an octopus or something like that no, I, I think I would go octopus I'm not that you got to pick one. What like are you going to pick? Like some people, their avatars are like them with a, a pumpkin head yeah. on. And I'm just like. I get pumpkin head. You're not going to try a pumpkin not head? A not a pumpkin once? head. No. I know. <laughs> you got one I'm time. <laughs> okay. This is your mission. You're going in undercover in the in the meta space. You got to pick something that isn't you. What are you going to ask? Um, something that's not me. Let me think. Ah. Oh. I thought all the other questions were going to be hard. This is the toughest <laughs> this one. Is the toughest this is high one. stakes, too. Okay. You don't want to screw this up. Um, I'm going in as a polar bear. The polar bear is the correct answer. You okay. won. Whew. I know. That was, that was really a close hard. one. You got it. Um, <laughs> all right. So you Let's go, go back to like the hard you, research. Question. Yeah, no, we're getting there. So so you're in you're in the meta space. I like to imagine were you in a park doing that? I like to imagine there's people in a physical park in a virtual park in meta <laughs> yeah. having a very mediocre time in the metaverse park yeah. in a beautiful park that they're not enjoying yeah it's it's very much like in my opinion amazon opening up stores mm. and it's like you know guys let's just let's just go i i mean i get it i get it for the world i understand accessibility and all that other stuff right but also let's try a park 
you know, yeah, let's yeah. let's go let's go back the real in, park. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like enjoy your local parks because they too need your support. Because if you don't support your local parks, like your local newspaper, like all your other local things, we're so yeah. trying to get everywhere we're not instead of enjoying where we are. And so, but by VR, I need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like well, support your local VR people too. Okay, so so get so give me some big wins that you've seen. Is that something that you've been like really impressed by or excited by in the space? Um, I've really enjoyed how they have been intentional using VR to expose students to um, more culturally relevant things that they would never get to see otherwise. Um, so Kai VR, she's one lady, she's been doing virtual field trips for students. And so a lot of schools don't go on field trips, especially during COVID. When not in Rome, you can go to Rome. You can go to Rome. So that's one thing where I'm like, okay, Rome, but a park, go to your park. <laughs> okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me throw something. Now okay. you're at, now you're at a park oh. and in the virtual space, and uh, and now you can you can go on your phone. We're in a park together. We go. Uh, uh, oh, here's like a QR code in in this park, and I can click it. And now I got like a little virtual guy mm -hmm. who's given us a little virtual tour of the park space, so we can appreciate the history of this park. And this is when I this, think that's this amazing. is the world's shortest slide that we're looking yeah. at. And they're like, whoa, I would have just walked yeah. right by that. It's so small. But now I know that we're in the park with the world's shortest slide. That's kind of cool, That's right? That's kind of cool. And then the virtual tour. So a lot of um, universities have been doing virtual tours. So when you go for your, um, your campus tour or when you're new and you come and do your orientation, they now have virtual tours that you can go on with your family. Instead of a guide showing you around, families can take the virtual tour, get to learn about the buildings, what happens here. There's kind of like little videos from QR codes that are placed around campus. So that's, again, I'll tell you what I don't like. Okay. The, the jokes aren't going to land the same. I'll tell you why. All right. Uh, so, so uh, as a as a stand up com, and I know stand up comics that do tour gu guide stuff as well, and uh, a lot of the audiences, but uh, like they, the whole trick of stand up comedy is, we, and we were talking a little bit about comedy before. Okay. But uh, but you, you're doing the same set like pretty much every set, you know a hundred times after by by the time some comedian has some special on something they probably told that act in almost that exact same way about a, a hundred times but the trick is making it seem spontaneous and the, to the audience there's this feel of like this person's coming up with it off the top <laughs> of the head uh, off the top of their head same with you go i i i travel all over the place, especially when I was new to comedy, I used to go on all of these tours of cities and okay. stuff. And you know, the tour guides have their routines and stuff and it doesn't work on me because I know it's contrived. I know this is the jokes that they use every time. But for the audience that thinks this tour guide, the double decker bus person's just winging this and making this <laughs> wonderful joke about you know the how Eiffel the tour. Made. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know how the sausage is made. Well, the virtual space, you already know this is like the, the written, this is is the joke yeah. everyone gets it's not there's not the same spontaneity to yeah. it so you're you're missing a little bit of something there but it is so cool to be able to tour some space get a little mm -hmm. bit of history or whatever at your own pace and skip over because the other thing is is sometimes you're on a real tour and you're like, I don't like this tour guide very much. Yeah. Actually, their jokes are falling flat and I don't care about this aspect of the tour as much as this aspect. I want to learn less about this, more about this in the virtual space that you can create your, you can choose your own adventure so yeah. much more. And it's accessible because if I don't speak English or if mm. I am hearing impaired and or, you know, if I have, um, if I can't see, now I have it where it's audio so I can hear um, and I know what kind of space I'm in and what's happening. And so now I feel more a part of what's going on versus um, feeling left out. And so I think it provides a great way for people to kind of have experiences that won't, 
that's really where I push. I, I'm really big about virtual environments being something that someone wouldn't be able to have otherwise. Mm. Um, even in the lab, it's like if you're going to create a lab experience for students, create one that they wouldn't be able to do. You know, if you're pushing hockey pucks across um, across a whatever those things are called that you push those across, <laughs> hockey pucks across, you know, don't don't create a virtual lab that does that exact same thing. You could do that, like you said, in your high state or your high price laboratory. But if you could give a student to understand why they're pushing that hockey puck across, you know, because you're learning this because you could use this for trajectory. And we use trajectory when we land on the moon or when we land on the space shuttle. And so let's launch a rocket. Like Let's do things to help students more contextualize this learning beyond this very rudimentary or this very small movement or piece of content that they're getting right now. I guess there's this video game um, like a decade ago or something. Uh, I don't know the name of it. I can't play video games because I will not stop playing video oh, games. Oh, are you one will, of those guys? It would ruin my life. Okay. It just that's I I yeah I have an addictive personality with okay. everything. Um, so I'm not allowed to do anything fun, uh, or it will ruin <laughs> my life. Um, and so. Uh, there's this some video game that they made they just mapped the universe mm -hmm. they just um uh, they just took all of the um um astronomical data that uh that existed and mapped out the universe and then you could just virtually travel around through the universe and and um, astronomers and physicists started using the, it was just a simulation of the universe. So they start using this, what was originally just made for a game for the, the public, okay. uh, was, was starting to be used by scientists. And they started learning some of their models of uh, of like astronomy or physics were actually like a little bit off because they weren't <laughs> matching some yeah. of the some of the virtual space. And and I, I imagine there's probably I I won't put you on the spot for specific examples, but there has to be um, things like that that when you when you go to create an accurate simulation of something, you end up learning. Um, uh, about uh, how to better just model reality in in general, which is yeah. what scientists are Yeah, so that's one after. thing we've um, all I always talk about. So I'm not a content expert in most things that I'm designing. So for most virtual laboratories, if I'm designing a zoology laboratory, well, I'm not a zoologist. If I'm mm -hmm. designing one for material scientists, I'm not a material scientist. So one thing that I always talk about with my um, with my collaborators, which are uh, typically other faculty members, is is that all of these are representations. It's just someone's perspective about what this should look like based on a whole lot of information. But this is technically not what it looks like. And they know that too, but it's something that I always have to remind them because again, they've been in this space for so long. They just assume like, oh, everyone knows this. It's like, no, 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 they don't. Like we need to let people know right. <laughs> that this is just a representation, that this is just our assumption over years and years of like, collecting data on this particular topic and modeling and simulations and kind of seeing that at the end of the day, this is what we think it should look like. So for instance, what you see in a crystal structure or all the models you see of atoms and things of that, not really how they look, you know, but we model it really to make it simple because that's relative on who you are, whether it's simple or not to communicate the elements that should be there inside of an atom or inside of a crystal structure or inside, but that is not how it looks. It doesn't look like those little circles that are all, you know, crushed together into a square to show you, oh, this is a crystal structure. And it's like, that's not really what a crystal structure looks like. Right, but it helps make people make, yes. make sense. So of it's it. all communication. So. so what you're doing right now in this science communication is again, it's showing people that there's more ways to kind of see, talk about, know a thing versus what they have been used or kind of forced to understand it as, as, a, as a curriculum.
Right, right. So, so, so you have you have people that might be, um, uh, you know, really uh, uh, knowledgeable um, polar bear experts yeah. that would make your polar bear avatar just exceptionally <laughs> accurate. But there would be like something about it that at that level of accuracy and complexity would kind of be uh, less intuitive for people. Mm-hmm. So so then uh, there needs to be a, a layer of, of design within the interface yes. to make it, uh, it's, it's one thing how a computer programmer would build something, another, yep. another with how a user will interact yes. with that. And so that's the user interface. So that's, that's what I do. It's how do we communicate this in a virtual environment in a way that supports um, other people understanding it without um, it becoming a barrier to their knowledge. What's that job like? I mean, what's that? Walk me through that. Like- I, it's fun. It is a lot of, um, it's fun for me. Let me say that. <laughs> I enjoy it because. It's miserable for everyone else. You're like, well, it's fun for you me. Know, it's else. fun for me because, <laughs> and I say for me because yeah. I, I don't think science should be hard. Right. I mean, it it can be a lot of parts to it, but a lot of parts does not mean it has to be. It's adding value. Yeah. yeah. Um, and sometimes in certain domains, I will not name the domain. Give me a dome. Sneak oh. it. Sneak, just whisper a dome name. I mean, <laughs> dom- let's just domain. say, and I work with a lot of them, Uh, (laughs) come on spill the domains some domains when they're trying to engineer things they may say no that's not what i said i said when they're trying to um (laughs) they typically their philosophy in my opinion in my experience so you know don't at me on my twitter that i don't read um about this is a that, wise move not using Twitter, <laughs> by the way, but go on. Sorry to interrupt. That they they feel like when you don't understand something, I need to give you more information. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you didn't understand that information? Let me add complexity. Let me add some more because right. maybe I'm going to give you a little more information. And the more information I give you, yeah. you'll get it eventually. And it's like, oh, no, that's. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Yeah, you know what so, I do instead? I I turn I turn up the volume yeah. and intensity. <laughs> someone doesn't get something. I, something if someone's a little confused about what I'm saying, I repeat the exact same thing, but at this time, I uh, yell it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, why are you? <laughs> so so, but I I joke. But your your point is taken about about. Um, uh, when, when someone uh, when someone isn't getting a concept, uh, some uh, some fields, scientists or industry will will expand on will will start pulling apart <laughs> yeah. the uh, the uh, dimensions of, yeah. of of the information and and expanding on it rather than trying to simplify. Perhaps. Yes, and so in virtual environments, I'm really trying to um, help contextualize and then draw attention to what we call the um, intended object of learning. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, how'd you know I was gonna like that? (laughs) Intended object of learning. Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, all right. So the intended object, so, so, so that's where you start probably, right? Yes. so, so, So probably, let me take a guess at this and then and then you uh, fill in all of my many blind spots and uh, and flaws in, in my intuition is that you if you sit down with uh, a, a group of uh, researchers, some head of some lab, some some uh, uh, some company that's interested in, in getting into this. You're you're first trying to get them to boil down. You're probably pressing them to boil down, kind of in in, 
a, almost a mission statement of sorts. Learning objectives uh, is what we call them. What, yep. what the actual learning objective is, yep. which, which I which I imagine a lot of people probably come into the process and find out really quickly that they actually don't have clarity on that first step. You are so correct. Have you been there? Uh, no, I'm <laughs> just <laughs> imagining how the human brain generally yeah. works. Under so one major... Um, Oh, what can I call it? Major hurdle. Let's call it that. Hurdle's a good word. That curse of knowledge, I bet. Are mm. you familiar with the cognitive bias, curse of knowledge? I am. Okay, great. Right. Not very, but yeah. um just just assuming that like like once you know something well enough, it becomes so intuitive yeah. to you that you you forget the things that, that oh, that's, would be that's unknown another thing, to, but that's to not new the people. first subjective. Okay, okay. The first hurdle, I mean first hurdle is that understand is not a measurable objective. So when you say, what do you want students to do? And they say, oh, I want them to understand what an atom is. And you're like, how do you measure understanding? Mm. You can't. And so that- So then they go, I want them to be able to describe now, these But then workers, what does it mean to describe? So now we got to figure out what this, how do you want them to describe it? Do you want them to be able to describe it verbally? Mm -hmm. Meaning I should be able to describe what aspects of it, what is considered, what is, here's the kicker. I'm trying to What do is valuable for your domain? What is considered a valuable way to describe something for your domain. So varying domains, because domains are cultures, right? Yeah. Every culture has a way of thinking, knowing, believing that is kind of specific to them. You know, comedians, like you said, as comedians, comedians have a culture and you guys have a way that you engage with other people. Even sitting here with you now, I have, I told yeah. you earlier, I had a cousin that's a, a comedian and right. you remind me so much of him just in he sounds like he sounds amazing already. <laughs> he is he is very amazing but just in some of the the ways that you engage um how you think in a sense like your questions these are right. questions he would definitely ask me okay um he's very inquisitive and even in how you how you talked about comedians liking a particular um audience you know right. setup he when he had the same he had similar, I shouldn't say same. He had a very similar viewpoint of comedy via the uh, internet over the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, losing that intimacy of the crowd. And so that's something that in your culture of comedy, you guys kind of have similarity, things that you value. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not a monolith, but you got a thing going on, right? And so the same things happen in domain. It's things in education that I value as a teacher that I feel like if I'm teaching you to be a teacher, there are things you should know, believe, think, ways of thinking and knowing that are specific to being a teacher. And it's the same thing for other domains. So when I talk to a content expert about how do you describe something i need to know I, I bet i bet they get frustrated sometimes <laughs> right because uh, i'm picturing it i think i think i would be a chore if you tried to like yeah if you tried to press me on 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 like clarifying and simplifying yeah. things i would uh, i can picture myself expanding on it and then and throwing more detail and and getting frustrated <laughs> that like that that the message isn't getting yeah. getting through that but is, I walk is that them is that it. what sometimes yeah it gets they get but i try to disarm them in the not, beginning not frustrated at you like yeah, frustrated yeah, yeah. with themselves with for the like process. not being but you, you yeah. just it's, it's the kind of um, illusion of explanatory depth is another yeah. fun cognitive by where where you you think you understand how something works really until you're asked yeah. to describe how it works and it's like but no I do know I just yeah. can't so it's it's always interesting it's um so I'll always ask if they give me a figure so we were talking about like representations and mm -hmm. I'll be like so why did you use this figure and they're like oh this is the one that we always use. And I'm like, but why? Why is that important? What does it show that other figures don't show? And they're like, you know, why is that important to your domain to show this particular figure? And they're like, no one's ever asked me that before. It's like, yeah, hmm. because in essence, you are trying to enculturate other people into your domain. Hmm. And so you kind of have to 
if they're novice learners, they don't know why this is important. They don't know why, you know, as a com if I'm a novice comedian, I don't know why having that close packed in audience is important until I don't have it. Right, and then I'm like, right, oh, right. that's well, now I failed in a sense there. It, 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 I had to learn that through trial and error versus you telling me as my mentor comedian to say, hey, you kind of need that feedback from the audience. You feed Actors off of contagious. it. You, yeah, right. yeah. And so but we don't teach that a lot. And when we're developing um, curriculum for teaching and learning. So when I design these environments, I try to create experiences that are meaningful, but also help enculturate students into the domain in which they'll be, they're trying to get into. It's such an interesting job. How, how many times do you discover that, that, um, that within a, uh, within a virtual space that some of, some of the way things are done are, now kind of just historical holdovers that that oh. are that are no longer um as functional these kind of um qwerty effects yeah. are, you, are you familiar yes, with the qwerty I'm effects very so, familiar. Uh, I, I i would imagine <laughs> yeah yes. yeah for for the listeners the <laughs> the idea that the the qwerty keyboard that we're all familiar with is is potentially not the most efficient keyboard if you were to wipe everyone's memory and build a keyboard from scratch specifically for um, uh, for our fingers and the way we, we interact with computers today. Um, it's different than how they were first developed on typewriters when ribbons would get yeah. jammed and keys would get jammed and stuff. <laughs> you would want to develop a, a keyboard um, differently. But now to implement a new uh, a new keyboard would require so much relearning within the population that it's just kind of not worth whatever efficiency gains potentially yeah. uh, you might have. Although some people do it, and 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 so when when you transition into a new medium um, or the context changes, and now you're in a virtual space, this there there must be a zillion examples. Yeah. Like so one is. Um it's going to sound kind of off, but dislocation, right? So teaching dislocation in material science and dislocation is really showing that an atom is not aligned. It's dislocated. It's kind of off to this, you know, it's, it doesn't have this kind of straight up and down. And I may be saying crystal. So I'm saying atoms and someone just like, that's not an atoms, but I also want to like to say to the audience, I am not a content expert. So I may be misking up the works, <laughs> but anyway, for dislocation and there's this formula that they do, right? And they have to draw it. And so I finally asked, it was like, okay, so how would this work in a lab? And they were like, oh, you would use a, a, um, a microscope. And I was like, okay how would this work in industry if I was a material scientist, you know, oh, you would use a, a microscope. And it's like, so why are we doing this? Like, why are we just not looking through microscopes? And they're like, cause we've always done it. Right. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, you know, and so finally they were like, well, sometimes it's, it's very expensive to power up the microscope. And so you want to do some quick calculations and kind of sketch it out before you have to power up the microscope so you can kind of assume what you should be looking for. You won't have to power it up. It has to be either so big or so small before the microscope can pick it up. All of these other things. So it's like, OK, you probably should tell your students that then like that's important for them to know that this is why they're learning this thing that they may not ever use ever. But because it's how you've always done it you teach it this exact same way as this kind of you have to do this you you know you're not a material scientist unless you know how to do dislocation by hand and it's mm -hmm. like really i don't know if that's <laughs> right right <laughs> interesting so. hmm so what um what are you um oh and this other question on my mind first that I want to get to. I like that you have all these questions. It makes me feel like so, you're interested. So many questions. <laughs> I'm very interested. Um, so th this is you. You mentioned earlier 
that some places may not have resources to build a whole, um, uh, you know, create a whole virtual room and all of these other mm -hmm. things. But but you can get these little cardboard VR things, and and everyone can download a. Uh, app for free that allows them to put on the cardboard VR and look around in this, yeah. in this, uh, in this space um, where maybe there's a simulation of uh, just I just did one recently that was um, of like a space station and something going wrong on a yep. space station and I was able to look through a thing and and simulate it and and change various conditions and this is a very very cheap way to um, uh, to walk through this simulation and uh, 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 what what kind of opportunities are there um, to educate people that might not otherwise have access because now now you don't need to even be in a university anymore now yeah. you can be anywhere at any age with any kind of level of education potentially and and uh, have access to some of these opportunities within a virtual space. So are you asking me where can people have this experience if they're uh, not uh, in a what, university or? No, like what, what kind of opportunities have you seen for people that wouldn't otherwise have had? Uh, I, I, I guess similar to I never went to college, okay. but I was able to educate myself without ever having to pay a college tuition mm -hmm. by going online and going I mean it's not the same experience yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I was still able to take moment. human behavioral biology courses from yeah. you know some of the uh, the best scientists in yeah, the world Coursera or whatever, has some you know. really good courses out there yeah yeah um, so are, are there VR things like that that are that are becoming open to the public where people are able to do like VR training or VR education and slowly but surely so here's the problem with that um it's access to the headset so mm -hmm. one the assumption is that everyone would have the same headset that is going on to the platform so for instance if you can university of michigan just put out um an xr learning experience via coursera i think they're doing one with their nursing program too to teach some nursing skills but everyone would have to have a particular headset. And so now you just created a barrier where I can't use a cardboard headset. I have to buy the Oculus 2 or I, I can't use my Oculus 1 I already have or my Rift or whatever the case may be. So that's one problem that's kind of slowing that down from being um, as, I guess, trending as you would assume it would be. Um, and then you had Google who did have a headset out for a very long time. I think it was the Lenovo headset that you didn't even have to be tethered. People were putting um, all sorts of good apps in there. I know I, Lapster had that I worked with that were putting um, virtual laboratories in there for students to use. And then Google was like, yeah, we're not keeping this up anymore. So it's kind of, we have to find a way that these technologies can be built on a platform and be transferred easily from one platform to the other, that um, you could use different types of headsets for the same experience. So you do have a lot of where you can use a headset and you can experience it virtually too. I mean, on a 2D computer screen too. Um, but you don't have it where you can experience the same you can have the same experience on different types of headset and so that's a because some heads are more expensive less expensive easier to access how many headsets do i have to buy like it's becoming my iphone now and so if i have the iphone you know headset one headset two like my iphones do i get to trade it in so we don't have that type of mechanisms yet where people can easily access headsets and then continue to get the newest, latest one, and like we do our iPhones yet. But I don't know how we'll get there, but I, I see us getting there some way. And what about, is there, has, has there been um, use of the virtual labs for, um, uh, for say scientists to collaborate with one another where there's, 
someone in like Japan or, or Australia or something that uh, there's there's a lab here at um, at uh, uh, UT Knoxville that that is maybe having trouble replicating some chemical process or something where they can just virtually model their lab so that the other so some scientists can that's maybe the expert in the field can come in and see where maybe they're getting some contaminant in the processors. I don't know how chemistry works at all, but are, are there, <laughs> are, are, are they being used um, in that way at all? Not yet. Not yet. That may be coming to a grant proposal near me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds really cool. Yeah. So I, you don't really see it to that extent yet. They've been using it. Um, virtual environments have more been in medicine so doctors so just like you said doctors can see but those tend to be big rooms like virtual rooms like the one you said you were in where it's kind of cameras all around someone's looking and then maybe someone else is in another kind of setups very similar and they can see what the other part, oh there you you've done that a little wrong move your hand this way so that is more medicine right now um which is not bad it means it's out there it just hasn't trickled down into the more mainstream um, experiences yet. I don't know about the military. I always feel like the military's probably been doing that our whole lives and we're just waiting for them to release to release the, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like GPS, like one day GPS just appeared and it was like, yeah. oh yeah, everyone uses it. Now it knows exactly where you are. It's been tracking you this whole time. And it's like, and we just got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like very suspicious. <laughs> um, well, well, what kind of uh, what kind of things are you looking forward to seeing in the future? Um, what, what are you hoping the military will release, or, <laughs> right. or, well, or, the or what what kind of advances <laughs> do you see on the horizon that uh, that you're um, kind of excited to put your energy into? So right now, I'm really big on VR and skills training. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, VR or XR. Let me be more clear. XR, which means augmented and virtual, um, has been really used for more cognitive processes. So problem solving, thinking, critical thinking, but we're really trying to transition it more to how do people do a thing? So uh, we have some great researchers here at UT that are looking at it from very basic motor skills. So can you learn how to hit this golf putt Mm -hmm. Right? It's a golf play. Okay. Because I'm also not a golf expert. Me <laughs> Into, yeah. you know, can, I, can you practice this swing? And so that's a skill. You know, it sounds kind of like a golf putt, but if I can teach you how to do that in VR, then can I, for what my interest is, as a nurse, can I teach nurses how to do various skills? Like, um, like I said, the NG2 placement and or um which is another one or what did we just do i completely slipped my mind um central line and so and the central line goes into the neck and so these are very common skills that nurses have but they don't really get a whole lot of practice at it until they're in a clinical setting mm. and that can lead to complications and that can lead to other you know things that I don't want to accuse nurses of, but just mm. let's just say. Um, and Sounded like an accusation. To me. <laughs> I don't want to hey, hey, that, that's got to that's got to feel real good for a nurse to walk in and be like, "Don't worry, I've virtually done this a thousand <laughs> times. I've uh, thousand virtually times. jabbed this but sharp thing down throats." But if you think about it, again, military pilots, just saying, yeah. they have it down to the second how long they need to be in a simulated airplane before they go into a real airplane and then go back to the simulation and then come out. And so they're teaching them how to, you know, fly an airplane via a video game first before they even get into the cockpit. So it'll, I'm not trying to replace that is one thing. I definitely want people to understand that this is not a replacement. This is opportunities to learn. I'm creating opportunities for people to be able to do a thing, possibly more times than they would in a traditional setting. So if your nurse, not your nurse, but a nurse 
hypothetically speaking, only had, don't want to say only, only sounds rude, had four hours of practice with the four other people on one skill before they took their competency exam, I think that nurse would love an opportunity to learn that skill a little longer, mm. practice it more, get additional feedback, all of these other things that will probably make them more secure or comfortable or whatever that they need so that when they go into the clinical setting, which has really changed um, how, how much access nurses have prior to being an actual nurse, like as they're nursing students because of COVID. So practice, traveling nurses have become a big um, thing now. And so there's not as many opportunities for student nurses to get into clinical settings. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an opportunity to learn. It's like, it's just opportunities. And so, yes, your nurse probably has done this virtually hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. But before she only did it physically for about four hours. <laughs> and it might have been a long time. I, I had uh, surgery on a, on a on a broken heel years ago, and it's uh, I think it was um, the second um, broken heel the X-ray tech had ever even seen in yeah. their career. So so and that's the, for the thing. ability for the surgeon yeah. to have uh, operated on broken heels is you know there's just it's a rare thing. It's a yeah. rare surgery. That so we did happen. a VR. Um, I designed a VR experience for nurses who were oncology nurses because when the um, and I wasn't the expert expert on it. It was an amazing um, nurse faculty member who was a content expert. But we designed it because when your um, chemo leaks into your bloodstream most one it doesn't happen very often but most nurses miss it because they don't see it very often and so if i'm seeing for the very first time chemotherapy dripping into the bloodstream because there's a leak in their you know in their um iv or some sort and it it really damages the body and so we use vr to to show nurses what that even looks like, how to respond to it, to train them on it. So with the hopes that if I show you and provide you this experience, when it happens in real life for the first time of like, you've done this a million times and you see this one or two rare times that you will be a better response because like the patient, they don't want, they don't care that this was your first time and you made a mistake, like they want right. you to help. And so that's what we're, that's why we call it opportunities to learn. <laughs> Very cool. And if people want to find out more about your work, where would you direct them? I would direct them to email me at sreve. It's really not the S R S R E E V E one zero at utk.edu, or they can follow me on Twitter at s at s m reeves with an s r e e v e s one. So, well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah, it was a great time. And thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next week.